today is a good day for sampling something extraordinary. So I am in the mood. I have my cards ready with some first impressions. So we're going to get to it. Our very and only, very beloved and only Joss Jane, who has a YouTube channel devoted to perfumery and a little bit of beauty, we decided to do a decant swap. So I've picked some creme de la creme from uh, Joss's collection and she also threw, threw in a few of her personal favorites for me to try. We are going to start with, let's start with kind of uh, premium designer things. Most of this stuff with one notable exception is going to be either niche or like boutique lines of the designer. So the one true favorite and I, if I'm not mistaken, Joss put it as a uh, almost like top one or one of the top 10 favorites in, of 2020, was La Belle by uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier. From the get-go, I'm like, this is like one of those, again, to my nose, which is not super trained in this particular category. This is one of those La Via Belle meets Angel meets Flower Bomb by Paco Rabanne. You know what I mean? These are like very voluminous, somewhat fluffy, very, very sugary perfumes. So the way that I remember Classic Alien by Mugler, their Eau de Parfum, if you take out the the icy anise like coolness i would think that the sweetness was very similar but again the, 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 the this doesn't have jasmine as much maybe it does actually not quite sure but again like to me this is also a marriage to la via belle i i call this <laughs> these type of perfumes as obesity in the bottle because one spray and you get this delightful multi-dimensional even though very persistent aroma around you that kind of stays with you for hours two sprays and you'll be dining alone the perfumes of this kind are all about moderation it's not that they are completely devoid of a pyramid or of opening or of complexity but they are made like they are like the, the beast mode trailblazers, at least from what I remember in the, in the history of the last 10 years in the designer world. I mean, I can see why a lot of people will like them because they are truly charmingly sweet. There's a lot of charm in the way that the sweet, sugary candy, like hard candy notes are played in here but you gotta be loving that kind of story. If you're a long-term fan of Angel by Mugler, if you have, I don't know, five flankers of Le La Vie Belle in your collection, I imagine La Belle by Jean-Paul Gaultier might make yet another twist on the your favorite story. For me, this will be enough for me for the years to come. I'll use it sparingly, like I use my three mil of La Vie Belle and two, three mil, uh, also three mil of Flower Bomb as like one spray for the day. That's the way that I would try to make these work for my nose. But yeah, I have to put this like as, as far as possible because otherwise this fragrance will dominate the story here. And now for higher end perfume lines of familiar brands. Lancome, Jasmine Marzipan. I asked Joss for a generous sample, thank you so much. Because this is one of the kind of, the Lancome, Lehman, uh, like what is it, My, Maison Lancome, something like that, like they are like the, the gold line in the, in, in the rectangular bottles. It's pretty much what designer market I wish it was. They have a lot of super wearable yet delightful gourmands. This is where gourmands are made to my liking. And I think the testament to that is that it's almost impossible to find them um, on really big, big discounts, neither online nor like secondhand on Mercari invoice, like, and etc. You will never find, if you find, consider yourself lucky, you'll never find Maison Lancome fragrances for like less than $70 and usually way above 100 
while some of the niche, surprisingly enough, if it's not popular, sometimes you can find minus 60-70% on niche. Maison Lancôme kind of keeps, keeps its value. A lot of people buy them, completely use them up. If they do resell them, they usually hold their value fairly well, which to me is a sign of universal recognition by niche lovers, by designer lovers. So overall, this line kind of hit the sweet spot of something that is both recognizable, trendy gourmand, yet still keeping up with the with the times when it comes to the olfactory profiles, but kind of also pleasing to to people's noses who prefer something a little bit more complex, a little bit more niche. And I think Jasmine Marcipan doesn't disappoint. This is a a very, very user-friendly yet well-crafted gourmand jasmine. That's all I'm gonna say. I'm, I've worn it all, only once, but I'm looking forward to actually giving it a go and then making making an executive decision whether I'm gonna get a full-size bottle or not. So very happy with that. The next one is gonna be Eli Saab Santal. I do have a full-size bottle, their Essence line, the like the boutique line. I do have a full-size bottle of Essence number no. one, which is Rose, very hard to find these days, and arguably one of the most unique, in unique sense out of all collection, because I'm yet to find anything remotely similar to the Elisab Essence number no. one Rose. Remarkable, remarkable, kind of light, airy souffle of a rose. So, I was very curious to try something more. I tried Gardenia from the Essence line. I tried Vetiver, completely used it up. Nice, but nothing special. And here comes Santal. I don't know how Joss found it, because a lot of these those bottles are just nowhere to be found, neither cheap or expensive. So, Santal. You know, it is a very different Santal to what I'm used to. I have Santal Majuscule by Serge Lutens, I have Santal by Floris, I have Santal Wood by Montal. I have a, a few perfumes that kind of put Santal uh, front and center of the perfume composition, yet nothing that would smell remotely like this. It's The opening is almost like scotch to me, like as, a, as a liquor. So by that that should mean somewhat of a combination of tar, wood, something somewhat resinous in a way. And then it starts mellowing into a super soft, spicy, woody composition. Not gonna lie, I'm in love. I don't know how long this is gonna last, but this is super cool. This is a true niche quality of a perfume. I would oh, I would love to have a bottle of this, but I have a, a five, five mil bottle, so if I use it up and I'm still desperate, Elisa Absental, here I come. Ooh, this is like my cup of tea, so my, I, I love spicy woods, I love spicy, spicy anything, this is my comfort zone, beautiful, beautiful, and rather unique take on Santal. My compliments to the chef. Now, I think we ought to move on to a more niche-like perfumes, even though some of them are more affordable, some of them are way more expensive. We are gonna talk about commodity whiskey. I have been gathering a collection of decans by commodity because at first, some of you probably have not already know, they were sold in Sephora. For the longest time, they were kind of pricey. Then, then I think they went bankrupt and Sephora dropped them consecutively. And they were selling for anywhere between 30 to $70 a bottle. I even got myself commodity vetiver for 30 bucks in Marshalls, I think. So, and then they came back to life. I think they found a new investor and they resumed their production. Whether they're gonna change the compositions or not is not yet clear, but commodity has, again, this is what I wish the designer market was like. They make 
quality, reliable, but very much user-friendly, very wearable compositions. There's nothing shocking about their fragrances, at least I haven't found anything twisted or shocking in there yet. This is can be a good thing for some people, this can be a bad thing for some people, but this is like a reliable, um, this is what I would use instead of the modern designer perfumes, to be honest. So, the one that I got from Joss is Commodity Whiskey. To be honest, it's anything but whiskey to me. I mean, I'm a big, a big fan of whiskey-based drinks. That said, drink responsibly, you get what, like, I'm not advocating alcohol usage, but I was looking for something like that. And it's not there. To me, the opening is almost like the smell of soil. At the same time, it has some kind of grainy, flat side to it that's, you know, that I would I would expect from my like a detergent. Weird. Maybe it's the, the paper. But I think I wore it, if I remember correctly, I wore it once and I was still not impressed. It kind of like eventually mellows out into kind of fruity sweetness. Maybe slightly boozy, but not in, in the way that would still make me think of whiskey. It's just not enough complexity, not enough character. I'm glad that I liked it because now I can skip on a bottle. But I do wonder, are we in the mood for commodity brand review? Because I have a few. If you have a renewed interest in what are the best and the worst, at least in my book, fragrances by commodity, please leave a comment below. We can, we can make this happen. I think I have now a, a sweet collection of fragrances that I could kind of wrap up together. The molecular perfumery, the bane of my existence, as much as I'm like, I'm a big proponent of contemporary niche, don't take me wrong, but the molecular perfumes just never, I don't know why, that never, they never impress me. So I thought that by trying the eccentric line, maybe, maybe that's where, that's where the true innovative beauty lies of molecular perfumery. So, Jaws generously offered me two eccentric perfumes. Eccentric, eccentric number four. Oddly enough, the, the, just the opening of it reminds me somewhat of Memo Janat. But that one is way more powerful and way more offensive to my noses because of the way they, they took uh, New Roli and put it front and center. Here I would find I find it a little bit more wearable. It's a green sour scent. And this is my problem with mo molecule perfumes. They all smell somewhat sour to me. Like it's something green, woody, musky, sour, grabby thing that I just don't like. This is what I smell in a lot of Juliet Has a Gun perfumes and actually a, a lot of contemporary niche perfumes that are kind of molecular in their marketing. I don't know, maybe it's something with my nose, maybe these molecules do share that in common, but it's like synthetic patchouli, synthetic white masks, synthetic... Um, kind of like champagne notes. It's just semi-sweet, green, sour fragrance. It's supposed to give you the impression of grapefruit with juniper, rose jam and santal. So I guess rose jam is the kind of the, the semi-sweetness here. But it's just lemony, green and sour. Let's see if eccentric number five is going to reverse the tide here. It's just a little bit more, more eucalyptus and woodiness. But otherwise, I have the same kind of pickle juice type of stuff. This, just, this is just sweeter, a little bit fruitier. And this is just a little bit more 
to the cedar side of things, right? More foresty in a way. Basically, all I can think of is woody, eucalyptus, and again, these sour white musks. I don't know, is it Izoe Super? Is it Ambroxan? I don't know, it's just... No, it's kind of like a contemporary shipper. A lot of contemporary shippers are basically made of these molecules. And I don't... I'm not in love. I could wear it if I had to, but would I want to? Probably not. Okay, now we're moving on towards something a little bit more exciting, at least personally to me. I mean, I was excited about all of these, it's just I knew that some of them I was likely to like, some, some of them I would be meh, some of them I would dislike, but that's the whole point of doing decant swaps, because you can save you money and try something new. Okay, She Press by Floris. It's probably my third fragrance by Floris, which is a British brand. And I kind of starting, I'm starting to get their DNA because all of their perfumes are polished to the degree of smearing all their cores into one <laughs> kind of like flat surface. For some reason, Floris perfumes are flat to me. I have Floris Santal, I have Floris White Rose, I think it's Floris. Um, it's just, I don't know why, they f smell flat to me. They don't really have much dimension and they don't open up with time. So the Chypress is supposed to be this, again, beautiful citrusy floral, the shipper that is semi-sweet with some fruity aspects, but it's more floral than fruity. I do like the opening, but then it gets to some kind of like weird lemonade situation that to my nose cheapens, cheapens it a bit. I'm really not a big fan of citron heavy fragrances and lemonade heavy fragrances, and this is, this is what really stands on my way of liking it more. She pressed by Floris, it's, I'm kind of starting to learn that Flori, Floris might not be my brand at all. So far, nothing from them really hit the jackpot for me. This is the brand that I have a bit of an obsession with, if, if you didn't notice my almost 20 bottle collection. This is L'Artisan Parfumé Droll de Rose. This is the rose I don't have from them and since I'm not like the biggest fan of rose perfumes, like I learned to like them in the past two years, but I don't really need that many roses in my collection, just if I'm honest with myself. But it's very easy to, accumul like, to accumulate way too many roses in any perfume um, library because rose is in basically everything. And it's like never dying trend to get yourself a rosy perfume. So Drill de Rose, is one of the iconic rose perfumes uh, offered by L'Artisan Parfumer, and this is their creamiest, more like makeup y rose. It kind of reminds me in the way that it's uh, the profile is composed of Mimosa, Mimosa Pour Moi, which is their creamy, lotion y type of mimosa. I find that Droll de Rose gives me a very similar impression. The problem is that I don't really feel much of a rose there. To me this is kind of creamy iris and actually violets. Anise and violets are probably my one of my least favorite notes and they're both here. I'm so glad I tried it and didn't just blindly buy the bottle because I would have no use for this. First of all, creamy, lotion-y kind of irises are not my favorite iris. I love when iris is more dry, powdery, prickly, or even green and rooty in combination with either fougere notes or with suede and leather. When it comes to anise and violets and can this kind of lotion-y smell, it's just, it's not, it's not really something I aspire to. But if you're into that kind of stuff, and if you do like Lipstick Rose by Frederick Mal, but that one is a bit too much for you, the Droll de Rose could be the kind of like eau de cologne distant cousin 
of Lipstick Rose by Frederick Mall that would give you what you want from that kind of olfactory profile without overbear overbearing strength and presence of Lipstick Rose. So that's for the Lipstick Rose lovers for sure, but it's not for me. Okay, Aqua di Parma Peonia Nabilia. I still remember when Joss showed it in her haul and she got it for like thirty dollars. <laughs> it was crazy. It was one of those absurdly, absurdly rare deals that Fragrance Net does every once in a while. Every day when they post new uh, new products, some of the products are like half priced and they will climb in price the like after four hours. So this is one of those deals, if I remember, just correct me if I'm wrong, I think that was one of those crazy deals when you could get full bottle of Aqua di Parma for like 35 bucks. Peony is one of the hardest accords to get realistically right. It's just almost always it slides toward these abstract rose, lychee, white musks, peony, whatever, 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 maybe even lotus and like some kind of watery type of notes. Very, very hard accord to, to just to nail it in all of the complexity of how real peonies smell. And this is no exception. I wouldn't call it like the paragon of peony olfactory creations. It's just I mean, it's refreshing, like a really good body spray, I would say, like maybe a morning perfume. If you really love peonies and you, and you like, you want to have 50 of them, this could be one to try. Would I really hunt it down? I don't think so. And in a way, I would probably even go for something like Magnolia or a more sensual skin like musky rose such as Burberry body tender if I wanted this type of effect I mean worst comes to worst Lancome miracle is always there and I find that I would probably go for that first before I would uh, do Aqua di Parma uh, Peonia Nabile but otherwise it's a charmer if you, if you really love Aqua di Parma stuff and you find it on a deep discount I don't think it will disappoint, but it's not something that would be like a crown jewel, at least not in my olfactory library. But will I use up 5 mil? You bet. You bet I will. Okay, the next niche perfume that I don't even know where could I possibly tried it, if not us joss for it, is Shazam. The spice explosion that kind of sends us back to the world of Kenzo, um, Jungle Lefon, maybe even My Darling Nikki by Wilhelm Perfumery. I have like a decant somewhere that I've recently tried. So these, maybe even if Saint Laurent Opium, though to my regret I actually don't have a bottle, I have a very distant memory of what that smells like. I would say the closest what I have in my collection would probably will be the uh, the the elephant Le Fon by Kinzo. This is a little bit drier. Um, it's cool. Yeah, I would say like it's very seventies in style. Forty one sixty is one of those brands that is sort of a lot of people have heard of, but very few people really have a collection of. I think Shazam is going to be one of those that will, it will whether you will love it or merely like it as like a decent representative of that kind, the oriental spicy perfume, depending on how it sits on your skin. I'm excited to wear it because I actually at this point can't predict, but I'm excited to, to give it a really good wear. Okay. Wild, uh, Wild Pears by Mantel. I already did review this fragrance in my Mantel collection. In particular, I was particularly curious about <clears throat> Mantel take on the Wild Pears because of the bitter peach situation with Tom Ford. I am, I swore off buying any of Tom Ford fragrances. I think I have probably one at this point. It's just 
too much of a marketing game for me. I don't know. It's just it's giving me like bad taste at this point. Like everything that's happening there, all the hype. So I was wondering like, but if I do want some kind of vibrant, super cool peach, maybe Mantal, who is the king of sweet vanilla white musk, these boiled sweet musks, maybe Mantal has it for me in no less a splendor that Bitter Peach by Tom Ford. And I, I'm surprised to say that it's the Mantal Wild Pears smells cheaper, flatter, and more synthetic on my skin versus on my clothes. So this is something that I will wear on my clothes and will not wear on my skin. It's a very rare event. Usually it's the other way around. And so far it's sweet but it's again, it's a monochord. It doesn't have much of a movement in time, at least not for me. So I'll probably enjoy wearing it as some kind of like spring, summer fruity fragrance. I'm kind of developing a bit of a appetite for fruity fragrances for like the, for now, for the early spring. We'll see how that goes. I'll probably use it up then and, and think about other options. I don't think that I'll buy wild pears, to be honest. One of the most amazing pears that I tried, I already have in my collection, and it is Lalique by Lalique. It's their classic perfume. I have it, like a huge bottle of it, and in a way that one is kind of like a cousin of Coco Mademoiselle by Chanel. It also, I think it's similar to Impreza by Pinhaligans, but I do have Lalique by Lalique. So I might just use it up, see if if anything new, that I find anything new while wearing this, but so far I would still go for what I have already in my collection rather than buy Wild Paris by Mental. But I, it's been on my wish list of things to try for a long time, so thank you just so much for letting me form my own opinion. And the other two that I have left here that just sent me, actually rather affordable, I didn't realize it until I actually looked up the price. Uh, so these are two fragrances by Lerber Lario. As far as I understand, it's like very affordable to kind of like similar to Jo Malone concept as far as I understand, though they have rather a fancy naming convention that is uh, it's gonna it's gonna prove to be a challenge to pronounce. Uh, okay, let's start from this one. Fresca Zenza. I hope I'm saying it correctly is pedigrain, lime, it's like citrusy with pink pepper and some of the sweetness provided by rose, lilac with subtle softness provided by iris. The, the, the kind of like the long lasting base here are white masks. You know, it is citrusy but it's kind of fruity that is not citrusy to me. So I guess it's the combination of lilac with rose, maybe with lime that to me almost turns it to a tropical fruits. I don't know why, but this is like creamy, creamy fruit situation. Uh, kind of like a gelato slash sorbet mix in a way. I like it. I kind of like it. And I, I'm glad I have only a small sample because I get tired of fruity fragrances rather quickly, but I do want to use up a variety this spring. So this is going straight to my rotation alongside with some of the other fruity fragrances I have in decants. So Fresca Zenza, I don't think I would be mad if, if somebody gifted me a bottle, but would I buy it myself? I think I have much hotter ticket items in my wish list right now, even though this is rather affordable. But I must say, nice profile. I'm gonna, I'm gonna memorize the name of the brand, Lerbrolario something there that is worth coming back to, I think. And the second one that I have here is Mehariz. Mehariz, Mehariz, Mehariz. It's my best attempt. A ton of cinnamon, almost too much to my personal liking. It's a lot of edible vanillin, vanillin and cinnamon. It's Compared as a very affordable version of Masque Vajor by Frederic Mal, I would agree. 
it is sort of to that territory, though I personally find that Mascara Major is deeper, more complex, a little bit more alluring. To me, this kind of just screams with the cinnamon and something even peppery there. It's kind of prickly, spicy, and simple. It's almost like a echo of, of what Mascara Major really is. I also have a fragrance that is along the same lines, and this is not a blue bottle by Histoire de Parfums, but I'm forgetting which number it is. Well, if you need it, I'll find it and like and leave a comment below. I'll reply and I'll tell you which one it is. But yeah, it's kind of like an affordable dupe, though a, a pricklier, more less refined, less deep. But still quite wearable, and I would say interesting, interesting dupe of Masque Visual by Frederic Mal. Okay, I've talked for a long time. I hope you enjoyed that. I'm super excited to see what Joss thinks of the decans that I sent her. So I invite you to join me, subscribe to her channel, and see what kind of decans she picked from my collection, what she think of them. We had a rather marvelous exchange. I'm looking forward to many more in the future. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Joss, for your generous package. And I'll see you in the next video. I'm going straight to Joss's channel. I want to see what she what she thinks.